Sometimes I shut my mouth, brain scared to falsely sight. But somewhere in my gut, I know. My heart knows wrong from right. Cause values seldom change, though circumstances may. And by preschool, we've learned lessons we must relearn as we age. You know, it's interesting because it really feels like YouTube is the wrong format uh, to have the kind of talk that I want to have with you right now. Really, I feel like this topic is so varied and so difficult and there are so many different sides to it that it's not like one person comes with the right answer. It shouldn't be one person talking to thousands. It should be thousands of people having individual one-on-one -on -one conversations. You know, I typically like to study these kind of things for months or like honestly years. Uh, before I feel qualified to speak on them. That being said, you know, even if you don't have all the specifics, you know, the heart generally knows its values. And so sometimes it's better to say something than to be so scared of making a mistake that you say nothing at all, right? So I'm gonna sit here with you as if I were having a one-on-one -on -one with a friend, right? And I hope that you come to me as a friend would, you know, which, essentially just means quick to listen, slow to judge. Whew, I'm gonna loosen up a little bit and I'm gonna pretend that you're the friend I was talking to last night over the phone. So my background is that I'm mixed, right? I'm a fourth black, my dad's half and half, and my grandpa's black. Uh, so it's, it's wild to me because, you know, the concept that black and white can coexist peacefully, it seems so simple stupid to me, right? Because it's like, it's literally taking place in my body every single day, right? It's literally, since I was born, this has just been a given for me. So I guess it's always just a little bit mind-boggling to me that it's, it, that that's not just default mode thinking for everybody. But also it's like, I get why it's not default mode thinking for everybody. Right, so that friend I mentioned to you who I had a video call with yesterday, you know, she's Nigerian and we basically spoke for three hours on the phone last night about everything that's been going on with Black Lives Matter, with the protests. And I told her about the initial concept for this video, right, that it was gonna be values that we all learn in elementary school that, you know, would help us navigate this situation now. And she touched on a metaphor that I was gonna use. She was like, you know, being black is like starting a race, but the other guys got in a 400 year head start. And when I heard her say that, I was like, oh my God, that's like exactly what I was gonna say tomorrow. Except, you know, it's not only like you're starting the race 400 years behind, but it's also like the guy who got the head start is also the same person who tripped you. Oh, wait, wait, no, 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 he didn't, he didn't even just trip you. He broke your leg, right? And then he's like, Whoa, dude, why aren't you at the finish line? And you're over here like, dude, like you broke my leg. Like speed's not gonna be enough. And then my friend chimed in and she's like, yeah, it's like, if you expect us to be at the finish line, it's like, dude, you're, you're gonna need to send a car to like come help us pick up. Like we are 400 years behind, right? So you get in the car with your broken leg and as you're driving to the finish line, on your way, there are people pointing being like, well, why does that guy get a car? You know, like that's not fair. And it's, 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 and it's just tough, right? Your leg hurts, your mind hurts, your soul hurts. But it's interesting because people lose sight of the fact that, you know, at the end of the day, all we really want is for everyone to just be at the finish line, right? Because life is better when we're all there. You know, the whole thing about our rights being intertwined. But the interesting thing was that we were talking about, it's like, the problem is, is that too many people think that we're already at the finish line. They think we're here, but in reality, we're here, right? And this is the most basic version of MLK's I Have a Dream speech, right? This is black and whites being friends, joining hands, sitting next to each other in classrooms, which don't even get me started on that, right? Like schools are more segregated now than they were in the 70s, you know, but it is true, right? A lot of progress has been made, right? But here is where we want to get, right? This is the part where Martin Luther King Jr. talks about judging not by the color of one's skin, but by the content of one's character. 
right? This is about true racial equality. This is about equal wages. This is about fair, equal treatment under the law. This is where we want to be. But the interesting thing is, is that the difference between here and here, this isn't as tangible. It's not as easy for people to see. And that's why they get mistaken and think we're all already at the finish line. See, so part of my original concept for this video was I was gonna talk to you about when we were kids, or even now, you know, like when you get a bruise and it's, you know, it's so light, nobody else can see it. But as soon as somebody presses that spot, you're like, ah, oh my God, ow! Oh my, what, that hurt, right? So we all understand the concept of just because something looks fine to the outside world, doesn't mean it is, right? Just because a wound looks fixed, doesn't mean it's healed, right? So that's why to solve the last piece of this puzzle, you know, it requires listening to your neighbors when they tell you something hurts, right? Even if you can't see it, and even if you can't feel it, you know, but being quick to listen and slow to judge, that's a huge component of what's missing in the conversation right now. You know, compassion, empathy, listening, loving, being quick to listen and slow to judge. I mean, think about it, right? That's why George Floyd's death is uniting so many people right now, right? Because it's so unequivocally unfair. You know that there is no room for argument. There's no room, right? So even in this world right now that we're in, where people are not quick to listen and they're very quick to judge, even in that world, you can't help but ask yourself, you know, how do we claim to be here when this video is showing us we're not even here? I mean, have you allowed yourself to watch that video and really feel it? And I mean really feel it, you know, just take in how unfair and how sad it is. Because if you allow yourself to feel it, it is impossible to ignore it. You know, but that's the thing is you have to allow yourself to feel it, right? Because my friend and I were talking about both of our first reactions to that video was just numbness. When you see something play out again and again and again, that things just systemically don't change and keep happening, if you allow yourself to feel pain every single time, I mean, that would break a soul. And that's why a lot of people are jaded, right? That's why a lot of people are sad. That's why a lot of people, you know, get angry and why they tell you, like, it's not my job to educate you on what's wrong, right? It makes sense why they feel that way. You know, but here's the interesting thing that my friend and I were talking about. It's like, you know, it's like black Americans are in an abusive relationship that they can't get out of right? That's re that is really what's happening. They're getting verbally abused. They're getting physically abused. You know, if they, if you go to any healthy therapist, they'd tell you if a partner does this to you, leave, like get out. Like this is not good for you. But what do you do when you can't just leave? Like in, in aggregate, it's not like every black person in America is just gonna extract themselves from the country and go start a whole new cut. That's not gonna happen, right? It happens on an individual level, some people completely moving away, or, you know, some people just in America but checking out, disassociating, refusing to engage anymore because they're tired, they're exhausted, they've been broken. That's why they're telling you, like, it's not their job to educate you. Boom. Checked out. So what do you do when you're in an abusive relationship with a partner that you can't leave. The best strategy I have ever seen, outside of systemic change, because that's, you know, that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking to the individual. The best individual effort I've ever seen for affecting change has been leading with love. Tell me if you've ever seen a strategy that works better, you know, but it's this idea of loving your quote unquote enemy, the bad guy because that's the person who in the end you want to coexist with peacefully, right? This was the strategy used by Martin Luther King Jr. It was the strategy used by Gandhi. And I mean, heck, if we're going there, strategy used by Jesus too. 
and I have never seen one person outside of a system be able to mobilize more people using any other strategy. It's probably a reason why Martin Luther King Jr.'s I have a dream speech, you know, went, went viral, you know, back in the day, right? Whereas his letter from Birmingham jail didn't get quite as much traction. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Letter from Birmingham Jail, essentially that's a letter that Dr. King wrote. In it, he kind of scolds uh, whites who agree with the civil rights cause, but they weren't doing anything. They weren't saying anything. Actually, his first line in there talks about how he's become over time more jaded with the white moderate, which is a completely fair standpoint to come from. And we've, you know, we've talked about that, like why someone does become jaded. But I think deep down, people know that love is much more convincing, you know, than scolding and guilting ever will be at convincing somebody to change, at convincing somebody to take action. And that's why the I have a dream speech resonates so much better, right? Because nobody wants to feel like a bad guy, nobody. Most people like to think they're good people. And so going back to the metaphor about the abusive relationship, do you know what happens when you scold an abusive partner? Do you know? Does anybody know? I know they don't want to face what you just told them, right? Because they don't want to feel bad about themselves. So they'll deflect, right? They'll say it's your fault. They'll blame you. They'll make you feel like you're crazy, right? And sometimes it might be too much and you act out in ways to the outside world that might appear crazy. That's what the looting is. It's not the problem, it's the symptom. It's a distraction. And frankly, that's why I don't like to focus on it. You also know what an abusive partner does? An abusive partner makes themselves look like a model citizen. While they're playing these mind games to you and you're going further and further down in your spiral. This is abuse 101. When you focus on the symptoms, when you focus on the looting, really that's just you missing the point. Black Americans are in an abusive relationship with a partner that they cannot leave, period. But what I will say, you know, enough Americans and enough white Americans have woken up to the fact that there's a problem to where, you know, you can look at this analogy and almost say it's like, yeah, America has an abuse problem, but it's like an abuser who recognizes they have a problem, wants to go to therapy and wants to change. So there's a part of me that feels like if we want things to change, then we do have to be willing to educate each other and ourselves right? And not just shut down people who are genuinely trying to learn or, you know, shut down people who might not be getting things 100% right, in your opinion. Because otherwise, you know, you get people too afraid to help. You get allies who are apologizing <laughs> before they even start to speak, saying, I I'm sorry, I'll, I'll never know your experience. And then they like regurgitate exactly what they're supposed to say. You know, but it's not about that. It's about all of us each having individual experiences and feeling comfortable enough to say them. But right now, you know, you have people who are literally too afraid to be vocal and to help. And you know how I know that? Because it happened to me, right? And, and I'm mixed, right? I am literally black and literally white. You know, if anyone should be able to say something on this, you would think it'd be <laughs> somebody like me. And even I'm too scared to say stuff. That's how you know we have a problem with compassion in this fight. And I'm not just speaking from theory either, right? I'm, I'm speaking from real experiences that scared me away from wanting to participate. One such experience was, I don't know if you guys remember, just a couple days ago, uh, on Instagram, everybody was posting a black tile uh, in solidarity of the Black Lives Matter movement and posting, you know, hashtag Blackout Tuesday. You know, and I thought, oh wow, what like a great way to show my support. You know, I have followers, this will let them know where I stand. Uh, so I post it and almost immediately afterwards, you know, I started getting some pushback from people saying how they're wary of influencers just you know, putting in minimal effort for the movement and really, you know, kind of insinuating that I'm just 
a fair weather fan like jumping on the bandwagon. Somebody said that I'm doing nothing to help. Blasting me for having done something to try to help. Um, and it's not just me, right? It's like y you see people posting to their Instagrams these blanket statements that say, if this is the first thing you've ever done to help the movement, then you're part of the problem. And I don't, I don't get it, right? Why would you alienate your allies like that? Right? Especially when you never know what's going on in somebody's life. You never know what their whole background is. Like for example, me, like why do I feel the need to justify to you guys that I've spoken at Black History Month assemblies? You know, that I've been part of the I Too Am Harvard movement, that I've cried over history, but why should I need to justify that? And it, it, you really never know why people choose to respond in certain ways to certain topics at certain times. And so for someone who's passing, like me, or for somebody who might be white, but for somebody who cares deeply about this topic to their very core, it kind of feels like this topic is this like fragile grenade that's just ready to like explode if you say the wrong words. And don't get me wrong, right? Like in no way am I trying to say that my experience is worse than, you know, the black experience of feeling physically unsafe or feeling, you know, mentally harassed on a daily basis. All I'm trying to say is that I'm not unique. I'm very, very human, which means if I have these thoughts, you can sure as heck bet that a whole lot of other people who are passing or look white are having similar thoughts. Wanting to help, but scared of saying the wrong thing and feeling bad when they try to help because people are insulting them when they do. You know, that's just counterproductive, right? To the goal that we're all trying to achieve. That's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is all stuff that I said to my friend yesterday over the phone, you know, and I said it freely just because, you know, I knew even if I said something imperfectly or even if the words didn't get out right that she wasn't going to judge me, right? She was first going to seek to understand me before she was going to pass judgment on the exact words that came out of my mouth. And at the end of our talk, she asked me an interesting question. She's like, at the end of your video tomorrow, Taylor, what do you want the message to be? And I'm like, oh, interesting question, interesting question. Thank you for asking. So the number one thing, obviously, was that I need people to know which side I feel is just unequivocally in the right, um, which is the Black Lives Matter movement. I want people to know that I agree that I think action does need to be taken, not just at an individual level, which is of course what we're doing right now, but at a systemic level, right? And so I will include links down below uh, with protests, you know, petitions, etc., for ways that you can take action now. Uh, but also, you know, there was a second thing I want people to get out of this video. I want people after this video to be a little bit quicker to open their ears and open their minds and a little bit slower to judge and point fingers because that's what I think is missing right now in this conversation. Who knew sugar spice everything nice would be the missing ingredient? <laughs> the power puff girls. No, but I do think this is such a simple stupid concept that I don't mean to, you know, I don't want to trivialize it, but I genuinely think the world is a better place when all of us, and I mean every single one of us, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, you name it, when all of us feel safe, physically, emotionally, spiritually, you name it. So in one sense, I guess my timing is a little bit off. Right? Uh, in one way, I'm a little late in responding to this topic. Uh, but in another way, what I'm trying to say might be a little early for where we are in the fight. You know, but if the consequence of me making this video is that more people have one-on-one -on -one conversations where they're truly trying to listen to people of different backgrounds, then that's what I'm aiming for, right? Then, then I have nothing to feel sorry for, except maybe that disgusting speck of dead skin that was on my face for the first six, seven minutes of this video. And on uh, that note, thank you guys for listening. I know this has been a long video, uh, but I think it's a worthwhile one. Bye.